right, everybody, can you hear me okay? Yes, in the back? First of all, let me just say how thrilled I am to see all of you here tonight. I didn't know who would show up. I didn't know if there would be five people, and I am just blown away. I am so thrilled to see you all, and you are in for a fantastic evening of education in which you're gonna leave feeling a little bit more empowered. Whether you love coyotes, you hate them, you're afraid of them, um, I think that you are gonna learn so much from John. I learn so much every time um, I, I hear him speak. John is, uh, was the um, Belmont Animal Control Officer for 17 years. He just recently retired. He was a sergeant in the Army for 20 years. We thank you for your service, John. And uh, he's just been a great mentor and a great friend to me in my first year as ACO with so many questions. He's always been available for me. Um, um, without much further ado, let's uh, get John and his presentation going. It's warm. Everybody use your papers that you got to fan yourselves. And uh, we're in for a great evening. Thank you all again so much for showing up. Hey, how's everybody tonight? You hear me okay? I really don't like this thing. You hear me now okay? Wait for the video? It gives me a tank. Sorry. <laughs> okay, hey, this is me. My uh, presentation is Living with Coyotes. Um, say again? Check one, two. <laughs> All this technical stuff, but I think we got it nailed. Um, I want to thank A Dog, the sponsors, and I want you to note that your chief of police is here tonight. And I've done hundreds of presentations, and only a few times did the chief show up. And I think that's that really shows a lot about your town and your chief. So, thanks, chief. I also want to thank Diane who um, asked me to come speak tonight. What a great ACO that you have here. Um, she'd be really happy with her. Wow. Look at that. I love it. All right. So tonight I'm going to talk about a lot of stuff. There's a lot of misinformation out there regarding coyotes. And um, I'm not here to change your mind, but I'm here to provide you with facts so you can make up your own mind about them. So I'm going to talk about factual stuff, um, management and coexistence, human and pet safety, which is um, a big thing, and also hazing, but hazing the right way. How many people heard of hazing coyotes? Okay, and, and you know that you're supposed to... Right? Okay. I'm going to teach you how to do it the right way, because you've been taught how to do it the wrong way. <clears throat> okay, so the eastern coyote. People are kind of flipping out about what to call them, coy wolves, hybrids, you know, whatever. Um, but the fact is, our eastern coyote is Wiley Coyote, <laughs> which is the western coyote, okay? And he's mixed with about 60% um, coyote, about 30% wolf, and about 10% dog. Not 100% on that DNA in the area. It can change a little bit. You, know, you can have a little bit more dog genes in there, a little bit more wolf genes. So, but that's generally their genetic makeup at this time. <clears throat> so, how did they get here? This is, um, oh wait a minute. This is a western coyote. This is not what we have. We have that guy mixed with wolf and dog. It's a new species, it's evolving. Um, but this is a western coyote. There's nothing there to really show you the size, but they're about as big as a very healthy red fox. So they're not very big. All right, so moving on. <clears throat> this is really important stuff because people get really angry and, and fired up about coyotes. They want to kill them all and um, you know, get rid of them and this and that. But 
what I want you to understand is how they got here. Because it was us that did it. And this is how it happened. We moved into this country, right, back in the 1700s or so. We started moving west. What did we do? We annihilated all the predators, wolves, cougars, black bears, grizzly bears, because of our livestock. So when we did that, that opened the door for coyotes, because they had no predators. And so their population started expanding. So this is the historical range where they used to you know, stay. And then when that all happened, they started migrating. And some of the coyotes that migrated this way would have met up with red wolves, and you'd see a lot of red in them. And I believe a lot of coyotes in this area have red, a good, strong red wolf gene in them. <clears throat> and then you have others that you know, went up north of the uh, gray, gray wolves, and others went west. And so the point is, because we have no tolerance for anything, our, our first reaction to predators is that knee-jerk thing, let's kill them. Not try to understand them, not try to farm with them, not try to coexist with them, but to annihilate them. So because of our actions, we've got the eastern coyote to deal with. Just a little pop. Um, <clears throat> several years ago, uh, um, Animal Rescue League called me and they said they had this little pup in somebody's backyard for about a week. It was up in <clears throat> Chelmsford and they asked me to go up and, um, <clears throat> excuse me, and evaluate it. So I get up there and sure enough, the little guy is curled up in the, in the ball, sleeping in the backyard. So I snuck up on him and I scrubbed him by the neck and I picked him up and he pooped. <laughs> yeah, but what did that tell me? Tell me that he's been eaten, right? Look at him. He's not hunting anything. He's too young. His parents were around. And for some strange reason, he was just alone in this lady's backyard. Of course, she didn't see what he was doing at night, but during the day, he was just curled up. So I just shook him and growled him and rolled him across the lawn and said, see you later. And I did that because, not because I don't like coyotes, because I love them, but I wanted to imprint on him to look at me in the face and realize that humans are their worst enemy and to stay away from us. <clears throat> this is a coyote that showed up in Belmont one time. Um, I think it was probably the first coyote that I actually got up close and personal with, and she was kind of cool. <clears throat> this coyote is an amazing coyote. He's at the golf course, um, uh, what's the name, the Fresh Pond. <clears throat> and I can't comment in the last two years because I wasn't very active, but previously, this guy and his mate had whelped three, three healthy litters during a three-year span. What's big about that is his, his spouse is completely lame. She got nailed by a car probably five years ago, has a healed fracture, but she can barely put any weight on it. She cannot run. So this guy, for at least three seasons, fed his wife and his pups and protected the den and kept the family together. Because usually if one loses a leg, it's not good for the family. But they stayed together. So he was really an amazing coyote. And <clears throat> can't really see it, but a lot of red in him. Really pretty. Okay, family structure. Um, January, February is probably the biggest time you need to worry about your dogs. Um, cats, year round. But if you have a dog, even of size, and you're out in the woods, and it's January, February, and you let your dog run loose, well, January, February is their breeding season. So they're, they're all pumped up with testosterone and hormones, and we all know what that does. So the fear level goes right down, and they will attack and challenge a big dog. I've seen it many, many times. So January and February, if you have a big dog, it's the only time you really need to keep them leashed and near you to protect them. <clears throat> Everyone here lives in an active coyote territory. Every one of us. No question about it. How many people hear them howling at night? Quite a few. Do you like it? Is it creepy? It's kind of creepy, but... It's good around Halloween. <laughs> okay, the pups are cared for by both the male and female. They really have a very strong family unit, um, very social animals, um, so they help out each other. Um, in October, November is usually when the pups disperse, but with coyotes, 
they don't always take off, you know, that first year. A lot of times they stick with the parents for two and three years and actually help raise new litters. They have no, um, no placement on the, on the hierarchy in the pack. They're, they're bottom, you know, they, they're allowed to stay, but they can't breed, they can't, you know, take any meals, they're the last ones to eat, that kind of thing, but uh, kind of cool. But normally, October, November, they'll, they'll disperse. And that's the time of year if you're driving around, look on the side of the highways, you'll see a lot of dead coyotes. Because those are pups that have no idea what a car is yet, and they're trying to cross, you know, cross Mass Pike and 128 and all that, and don't make it. <clears throat> um, out in the woods where there's not many people, they will tend to reuse their dens, and the den is usually the focal point of their territory. But around here, like when I was the ACO in Belmont, if I found a den, I just couldn't help myself. I wanted to get there and see pictures of pops, and so I'm sticking my arm in there with the camera, and you know, so they just move. The next day, they're gone. So around here, with a lot of people, I'm thinking they probably will dig three or four dens and move them when they need to. Okay, a lot of people think coyotes are nocturnal, right? You guys all know that? wrong, they're crepuscular, which means they're more active during low light hours. And it's a learned behavior. They don't like people, so they're more active when we're less active. But they're not nocturnal. They don't have any special rods and cones in their eyes or any of that kind of stuff, radar and sonar, whatever. They don't have that. They're typical you know, canine, where they function mostly during the day. But because they don't like people, They've kind of changed their behavior where they're more active when we're less active. <clears throat> um, I get it when people tell me that the coyotes scare them. This was a, a healthy coyote, and I can imagine somebody, you know, looking over their shoulder and seeing that guy staring at them and getting a little bit frightful. But once you understand them and understand their behavior, there's really nothing to be afraid of. And this guy was just terrified of me. Every time I even took a step near him, he'd take off. No threat whatsoever. Okay, family structure. The alphas will mate for life. Um, they defend established territories. And it's something interesting happened last, you know, maybe two years ago in Waltham. <clears throat> I used to think coyotes were very audible. You know, like, like if there's a transient coyote moving in, he might howl to see if there's anybody home. And if a family is an established territory, they may howl back. And so the transient coyote says, oh, somebody's home, and they're out of there, right? But turns out that they will actually, at times, kill another coyote who's intruded in the, in the territory. Which really shocked me. I didn't think they would do such a thing. But I've got it on film. So, and it was during the breeding season. And so um, they, will, they will defend their territory and their mates. <clears throat> Pups leave the den at about six to eight weeks, and once the, the pups leave the den, they're all on the move. They'll have rendezvous spots. You may be walking out in the woods and all of a sudden see four or five coyotes all curled up in a ball, sleeping wide open. And you might think that's abnormal, but it's not. It's the pups have been put there by their parents, they're under their watchful eye, and they're just told to just stay still. So you might come up on them and they're just, you know, like frozen. But I wouldn't mess with them. <clears throat> Pup mortality rate is between 50 and 70 percent. I've had a lot of um, even ACOs over the years call me and challenge me and say, "Look, I found five dens in my town. The average pup litter is, you know, six or eight. You do the math. I'm going to be overrun." And I said, "Dude, half of them, more than half of them, aren't going to survive the first year. So what are you talking about? So a lot of people need to know that they're not breeding out of control." They actually will manage the, their own um, population levels. <clears throat> the alpha female is the enforcer of the pack. Has anyone ever heard killing coyotes makes more coyotes? Ever, anyone ever heard that saying? Well, the, the reason behind that is, there's actually several reasons, but one of them is mama, the alpha female, one of her jobs is to take care of the pups. And I mentioned transient coyotes a minute ago. There's two types of coyotes. One is a transient coyote. That's one that doesn't have a mate, doesn't have a territory, and he's just bebopping around, checking things out, going wherever he wants to. 
And then you have the coyotes most people are familiar with that, you know, get a family, they set up a territory, and they live there. <clears throat> so mama, if she's killed, then there's nobody there to prevent those pups, the female pups, to breed with those transient coyotes. Because once you disrupt the, the alphas, once you kill one of them or both of them, that pack is dissolved. It's in, it's in disaster. They don't know what to do. And so you have these young female coyotes that run around without mama telling them what to do and what not to do. And then you have the transient coyotes that come in and mate with them. So you end up with more coyotes. It's just that simple. I was talking to somebody earlier who believes that they can wipe out coyotes. You can call Mass Fish and Wildlife anytime you want, and they're going to tell you you're going to have to kill at least 70% of the entire population at one time in order to start slowing them down. But you won't get rid of them. It's not going to happen. When the world ends, we're going to have cockroaches and coyotes. <laughs> guarantee you. <clears throat> Another thing that people talk about, koi dogs. You know, oh, that's a koi dog. It is possible for a coyote to mate with a dog and have a pup. But out in the wild, it just doesn't work for a couple reasons. One, dogs come into heat twice a year at any time. So out in the wild, they need to come into heat in you know, January, February, so they can have the pups early in the spring so the parents can teach them all summer how to be good coyotes. Well, if you throw a dog in the mix, forget it. It's not happening. So those pups usually end up dying. So although it is true that you can't have a koi dog, it just isn't happening, okay? It just doesn't happen. About average of five pups, um, late April, early May is when they're born. Um, but that, that depends on a lot of things. If there's a lot of food, then the litter size may go up. If there's not that much food, then the litter size may go down. Most all animals do that. And the gestation period is the same as a dog, 63 days. Um, and the lifespan of the wild is four to five years, and there has been one coyote that was in a zoo or somewhere, and it lived for 19 years. Pretty good. But, you know, he got good veterinary medicine and all that stuff. Now, the next thing I'm going to tell you, you guys are going to think I'm crazy, but it's true. That sometimes coyotes mate with dairy cows, and we get this. <laughs> okay, I'm kidding. No, I'm joking. This is a, a real coyote. A uh, good friend of mine, Dr. Jonathan Way, who used to be an Arlington resident, um, is a coyote researcher. And you can see he's got the radio collar on. And this was down in Barnstable. And it's, a, it's, it's been DNA tested and everything. It's 100% Eastern coyote. But look at it. Isn't that crazy? <laughs> so I was just joking, okay? So what you think? Everybody loves a good picture of puppies. And that's, they're probably maybe a little bit bigger by now, July. No, probably about that size, yeah right now. Very resilient coyotes. If you look carefully, this coyote has three legs. This leg right here is gone. And look how healthy it is. This was up in North Andover. You see just a little stub here? Um, amazing. Look how healthy this coyote is. And it's got three legs. So it either has a really good mate or he can kind of get along with three legs. <clears throat> Okay, common diseases, ailments, just like dogs, they get mange, distemper, rabies, all that stuff. Um, they get lice and mites and fleas and ticks. And I'll tell you, I've picked up a few coyotes in my day, and uh, I'll never forget this one time. I picked up a coyote in Belmont, <clears throat> brought it down the town yard, and had it in a pickup truck, and I had it on the, on the thing there. And I ran my hand on it, and it was like grapes, just all the way down. It was, oh, it was awful. The poor thing was just covered in ticks. I don't know how they deal with it. Brutal. And uh, they, again, they're in the dog family, so I have seen coyote scat with tape, tapeworm segments in it. I've seen hookworms. So, you know, the poor things that, you know, our dogs get tapeworms, hookworms, or whatever. We go to the vet, cured. But wildlife doesn't get that option. <clears throat> Rodenticide poisoning. I know it's a big issue, and I'm just going to touch on it lightly because I know it could really blow up. But people are poisoning the very animals that will get rid of rats. You're killing owls, hawks, eagles, foxes, coyotes, raccoons, fishers. You're killing all those animals to kill rats. What you really should be doing is encouraging those animals to come to your backyard and eat the rats. 
without the poison. But what's happening with coyotes, sometimes it'll kill them if they eat enough rats with the rat poison in them. But usually what happens is it lowers their immune system, so the mange mites that they have already naturally occurring in their skin, their population goes boom, and all of a sudden this poor coyote is scratching and itching and, and has an awful time with mange. And nobody takes them to a vet. But this is a coyote with mange. Um, has anyone been to Wolf Hollow? It's a great place. If you've got kids, it's cheap. You've got to see wolves right up close. It's awesome. But anyway, I went to see wolves, and I was leaving, and there was a big field across from it, and I saw this coyote. Um, and I couldn't catch him. But, you know, his, his eyes are swollen. Hip bones are already showing. He's in rough shape. But it's because he's got mange. He can't sit still. He's always got to move because he's itching. So when you're doing all this stuff, all the rabbits and mice, they see you. So um, it doesn't get much, it doesn't, doesn't get help. This is a coyote I captured um, <laughs> way back when. I actually caught him, yeah, I caught him in Belmont. Belmont has this little tiny little farm, and then right across the road in Cambridge is the, um, the, the golf course. And this, this poor coyote had mange real bad, and they wanted to get help, so they called me. And I came down there, and they were all like, well, they were all like whispering. And I'm like, what's going on? What do you guys want from me? And they, wanted, they didn't want to kill, because they figured animal control, we're going to come down there and shoot it. So I said, no, no, no. They wanted the coyotes there at the golf course, because they eat the rabbits, the woodchucks, the geese, the geese eggs, all those things that get in the way and bother us, right? And the same with the farmer. He says, I want this thing back. He eats the rabbits, the woodchucks, the mice, and the rats. So they understood and un understand the value of coyotes. So I said, I'll put in the effort. I caught them, <laughs> really lucky. And as you can see, when you have mange, and I've had it, it's like poison ivy on steroids. It's brutal. You cannot stop scratching. I had it once. I was a, I was a veterinary technician in the Army. 20 years, and like my 19th year, I got mange. <laughs> and I still have it. So this is the coyote afterwards. You see Mass Fish and Wildlife gave her a nice little earring. She's very healthy, and if you'd like, I could show you the video of her being released. So before, I'll back up a little bit. So I caught her, took him out to Tufts, and then Tufts Wildlife Clinic, which is, is just like heaven to me. Um, and what they did is they just treated it with ivermectin without any human contact whatsoever. They do it between guillotine do doors. And it got all um, healed up. And the larvae are supposed to release them when you catch them. So um, this isn't exactly where I caught it, but Mass Field Fish and Wildlife okayed it. So if you want to see the video, OK, so I have to tell you something kind of funny. <laughs> I was in the Army, like I said, 20 years. My job was a veterinary technician. Primary mission, military working dogs. They are shipped around the world in cages like this all the time. I have probably opened 2,000, 3,000 of them. Do you think I could open this thing now? <laughs> Boston Globe was there. We had all these people. Everybody's like, come on, open the dang thing. So finally, I get it open, I think. And for all you people that think the coyotes want to just attack people, I want you to see how vicious this animal it is when it gets out of this cage. <laughs> Come on, John, open that thing up. Let's go. Isn't that the coolest thing? That was awesome. That was so awesome. And I did see her about six months later about 300 yards from that spot. So she, she hung around. This poor little coyote was in Waltham, and um, the animal control officer and I got together and we were able to catch it. This thing has a secondary bacterial skin infection along with the, the, the mange. And again, we sent it out to Tufts and they healed it up beautifully and we brought it back to Waltham and released it much to the chagrin of Waltham residents. <laughs> <laughs> so feeding. <clears throat> a lot of people say, well, they got wolf genes, they don't want, you know, why aren't they eating like wolves? Well, the thing about wolves is they need vast expanses of land. They need vast herds of deer and elk and moose because wolves are huge. So that's why they form these big packs, so they can bring down 
big food. Well, coyotes aren't quite there yet. There is a lot of research in the skulls right now going on where their skulls are actually changing. That little ridge in the top of their head is getting bigger, which allows for more muscles. So they're evolving into a wolf-like animal, no question about it. And the reason is because there isn't any more wolves here. We killed the last wolf in this state 180 years ago. So we've had no top predator in this state for all that time. So that's what happens when you kill off the top predators. All those mesopredators like skunks and raccoons and rabbits, their populations just go up. So when we get in the mix and screw up the balance of nature and the ecosystem, this is what kind of thing we got to deal with. So anyway, so coyotes, they're not quite big enough to take down a deer. Um, they will certainly go after one that's been hit by a car or wounded or in deep snow because that gives them an advantage because they're opportunistic feeders. So whatever good opportunity comes up, they're going to jump on it. Um, and that's the difference between wolves and coyotes because wolves only eat ungulates, you know, uh, moose and elk and all that. Coyotes, I've seen them lay out in the sun in August, 105 degrees out, you know, 110% humidity, just laying there snatching bugs out of the air. Just eating bugs. Too hot to run, so they just eat bugs. It's amazing. Amazing. <clears throat> um, they'll also eat rabbits, woodchucks, all this stuff. Um, and pets. I want you to know, I love dogs more than anything on this planet. I, I swear to God, I do. I, I, there's nothing better to me than a dog. And I don't ever want to have a dog taken by a coyote, hit by a car, whatever. I don't want that to happen. So a lot of this presentation is to try to prevent that stuff from happening. So if you people know what's going on with coyotes, maybe we can stop the predation of dogs and cats. But it takes a little work. If you have cats and you let them out, that's a big no-no. You can't blame a coyote or anything else that rips your cat in half if you let it out. So we have to manage and care for our own pets much better than we have in the past. And I know it's, a, it's an inconvenience and now at two o'clock in the morning you gotta get out of bed, get Fifi, put her boots on and take her out in the yard and throw minus three degrees. I get it, I get it, by a fence. But the fact is, they're not going away, ever. They're not going away, people. No matter what you think or what you try to do, you can call in the National Guard. They're not going away. And so that just means that we have to learn to coexist with them. And it's easy. It's not a big deal. All right. Over 75% of their diet consists of rodents. And a little asterisk here. Why would that be important that that includes the white-footed mouse? Anybody know? Lyme disease, white-footed mouse is one of those species that Lyme disease has to go through in their little process. So when you get a, a, an animal out there that's, you know, 75, 80% of their diet is rodents, it's a good thing to have them around. I've had Lyme disease three times. It's no fun. So having coyotes around is a good thing. And they'll eat about 1,800 rodents a year. And if you ever see a coyote hunting with other coyotes, it's pretty cool. They, they communicate by posturing. Um, they're very silent when they're hunting. And, um, and then they're very noisy once they make a kill. Has anyone ever heard that? When going crazy kind of stuff? Yeah, it's kind of cool. And they are the only canid known to man that will climb a tree. So if you have pear tree, apple tree, whatever in your backyard, and you get up some morning, you look out your window, and there's a coyote up in the tree, you're not seeing things. <laughs> it happens. They really will climb trees. Typically, this beautiful animal, I wish you could see it on my laptop, but this was taken in um, Belmont, the country club, the whatever it is, near Lexington. And as you can see, leaps up in the air, pokes around, focus. Look at the red. See the red on it? Beautiful. Chases it. That's a vole. And then dinner. And if you look, look at the body mass of that animal compared to the coyote. That's a really good meal. That's like steak, potatoes, salad, and a glass of vino on the side. <laughs> right? And I watched her eat three of them in a, in a uh, time of an hour. And sadly, 
three days after I took these pictures, she was hit and killed by a car in uh, Lexington. And then even more sad, I had a frozen solid in my police freezer for 16 years. And then when I got medically retired, what do they do? They dump the freezer. <laughs> so I wanted to have a stuff, but never happened. But beautiful, beautiful animal. One of my favorite pictures. You know, you know that um, guy who says, you know, the, the rest of the story kind of thing? Okay, we know that that's not a Jeep, right? <laughs> right? That's not a Jeep. So I'm thinking, let me just kind of, you know, get into your minds. You're all thinking that Wiley Coyote, whoop, oh, I ruined it, didn't I? Damn it. Damn buttons. All right. You're thinking that Wiley Coyote is going to come in and kill Bambi. Testing, one, two, three, can you hear me? All right, that's better. So anyway, he's an ethical hunter. He's out in the woods and he found this deer with an arrow stuck in it, dead, frozen. And so some unethical hunter shot this deer and left it. You know, either didn't take the time to go get it or whatever. So he put it up, staked it out, and put some uh, cameras on it. So that's, that's what we got here. Um, also, I want you to look at, as I go through pictures of coyotes, look at this little flap thing here. You'll see it, and we'll talk about it later. And of course, McDonald's is on their menu. They're absolutely right. All right, so where can coyotes be found? Anywhere. They're on Martha's Vineyard right now. I'm sure of it. I don't know if they paid for the ferry or if they swam, but they are on Martha's Vineyard. Um, but you know, if you haven't seen a coyote and you're driving down the road and you look over your shoulder and see this guy, your brain is probably going to say, oh, husky, dog, don't pay attention to it. And you may not even remember seeing it. But when you go home tonight, after seeing all the pictures of my coyotes, the next time you'll see one, you'll know it. You'll know it. Okay, dog versus coyote. I want to talk about this really quick. A lot of people will call Diane, your animal control officer, and say, Diane, get to my house quick. There's a coyote in my backyard. I want it killed. Diane might just say, well, hold on a minute. I, I got some, another call, and I'll be by when I can. And the reason why she's doing that is because, A, she knows that almost five, six million people are going to be bit by dogs in the United States every year. And it's a real concern. Dogs kill people. Right? 100,000 people need attention, 1,000 a day. This is the kind of stuff that you know, control officers are thinking about. So when you call because you've got a coyote that's just sleeping in your backyard, and Diane says, hey, grab a camera, take a picture. I'll be there you know, in a couple hours. It's because she's more important. Uh, she's, more focused on stuff that's more important, okay? Was it 10 years ago in the town of Weston? On a Sunday afternoon, family was out having a grand old time, and the dog, the husky, whatever it was, turned and killed one of the kids. You guys remember that? It happens, and when dogs kill people, it's a mauling. They're not hunting, they're killing. So it's awful. So when we have coyotes that aren't running around biting people like everyone thinks they are, and I'll show you the statistics in a minute, this is what animal control officers worry about right here. And it's not that she doesn't care about your coyote in the backyard. She cares about that 110 pound, I don't want to give a breed, but you know, bad dog running the streets. That's what's on her mind. Well, I just said that, didn't I? <laughs> Saved my breath. All right, rabies. A lot of people ask about rabies. They're a mammal, they can get rabies. Absolutely, no question about it. Um, this is speculation, no, no research or facts to back this up, but I believe that, um, you know, when I was hired in Belmont, my boss told me, John, every 10 years we get a spike in rabies. It's like clockwork. Every 10 years we get rabid, rabid animals everywhere. I said, okay. So after the, like, 12th year and didn't see any rabies, <laughs> um, I kind of wondered about it. And, you know, there's two types of rabies. There's dumb rabies and furious rabies. 
We all think of furious rabies, Cujo, throbbing at the mouth, biting, biting inanimate objects, right? Fact is, that's a very low percent of animals that get that. They usually get dumb rabies, where they just get sick. They walk in circles, they fall down, they vomit, they die. So if a coyote's walking through the woods and he sees a 40-pound raccoon who's walking around in circles and falling over, now normally he's not going to go after a raccoon, but he'll see that as an opportunity to say, hey, there's something wrong with that animal, and they'll take him out. And you can eat rabies and not get it. So I believe that coyotes will have an impact on those spikes in rabies and may have already, just have no way of proving it. Okay, so here's some numbers for you. Um, about 26 years of data, this is animals that have tested positive for rabies at the state lab. You can look this up yourself if you want. <clears throat> for all you people that love to let your cat out at night, hello, look at what he's running with. Look at, these are high rabid rabies carrying animals and they're nocturnal. So when you let your cat out at night, those are the people he's messing with. So not good. So now we have 206 domestic cats right behind foxes. Number four on the list of testing positive for rabies. Okay, should tell you something. You let your cat out at night and he's running with this crowd, not a good thing. And we've had 16 coyotes testing positive for rabies. Okay, am I, am I boring you people? Because usually when that slide comes up, people go, ooh, ah. You know? All right. Okay, suburban coyote. They are so well suited for this type of living. Um, Belmont, Arlington, Lexington is perfect territory because we have those areas where there's big houses and big backyards and they need a place to crash and just chill out during the day. So they might find a spot out right behind your garage in your backyard. You may never even know it that are out there. Um, Belmont, Lexington, Arlington, we all have those little pockets of, of, um, of conservation land. Those are all places coyotes need to go. They need to have a place where they can feel safe. So um, as far as this type of area, perfect for coyotes. Um, they'll use those woodland corridors for movement. Um, cemeteries, we see them a lot in cemeteries. Um, and I want to remind you that, again, they're here evolving into this new creature because of our intolerance of wildlife. So we have to change the way we think because if we don't, stuff like this is going to keep happening. I wonder what the next thing is. Imagine great white on steroids. <laughs> um, and you hear a lot that, oh, well, you know, we're cutting down all the trees, we're pushing coyotes into the city. That really pertains to most all wildlife except coyotes because they kind of like city living. They don't like paying the taxes, but they like coming in the cities because there's plenty to eat and plenty of places to, to run and hide and feel safe. This coyote actually looked left and right before she crossed the road. What do you see her? <laughs> and uh, this is an awesome picture. See the thing I was telling you about? I actually I sold this um, picture to um, Defenders of Wildlife about 10 years ago. It was in their magazine. Okay, so encounters. How many coyote bites do you guys think has happened in Massachusetts since their arrival, which would put them at about 60, 65 years in Massachusetts? How many do you think? Throw a number at me. Zero. Two. Five. Okay, you guys are very educated. I, don't, I can't get you on this one. But here's the facts. We've had 12 recorded coyote bites in the last 65 years here in Massachusetts. Four of those were confirmed to have rabies. And there was another one based on observation and history and um, the, you know, accounts of the incident. They were sure it had rabies. They just never found it. So. When it comes to rabies, you, you know, if an animal has rabies, it's out of its mind. You can't blame it. It's, you know, it'll bite fences and whatever. So, but a lot of people think that they're running around attacking people left and right, eating children and grandmothers and all kinds of stuff. <laughs> it's just not happening to people. But the media, and I apologize, but the media has not been very good to coyotes, and I can give you some examples, but 
let me move on a little bit first. Um, <clears throat> when we have coyotes in town, as long as they're not feeding them either directly or indirectly, and they stick to their natural foods, then they can stay in town, run around eating rats and rabbits and woodchucks without bothering anybody. It's just when we get in there and we get involved, there's a lot of bleeding hearts. I see a coyote, it's a little skinny. Oh, I want to feed it. And they start feeding them. Bad thing to do. Never feed wildlife, especially coyotes. Coyotes will bite people if they've been fed. And then people stop feeding them. They want food. Let me give you a quick example. The first bite in Massachusetts happened about 19, 20 years ago down the Cape, right? Media was crazy, Hel you know, rappelling out of helicopters, cameras everywhere. This young kid gets a bit on the back, but, you know, it was mauling and whatever else, whatever words they use. But sure enough, the kid got bit in the back. And so they hunted that coyote down, they shot it and killed it. And they did a necropsy. And what they found was... It had a professionally healed long bone fracture in his leg, which if he was out in the wild, there's no way he would survive. So it was like, hmm, what's going on here? So about six months goes by, and the truth comes out. A veterinarian going to work, hits the coyote, feels bad, brings it back to his clinic, and does surgery, heals him up, and then every single day, he does what? He goes out there and he feeds it. Coyote sees food, face, food, face. Food, face, food, human. And so thinking he, he was doing a good deed, he let the thing go when it was all healed up. And the kid had a school lunch in his backpack. Coyote went after it. The media never came back and told you the rest of the facts. And that's what happens. I'll give you one more example about the media. I think it was, uh, I can't remember the name of town. Um, anyway, Melrose, I think it was Melrose. I remember it was in the wintertime, and again, the media was like, swarming on this guy, all kinds of bandages on his arm and all that. And I remember his, his quote, he said, a pack of dirty, stinky coyotes attacked me. And so that was the big news thing. So I looked at those wounds on the, just on the TV, and I'm like, there's no way. That's not a coyote. And my friend, Dr. Way, who's a coyote researcher, thought the same thing. So a little investigation was, was, um, was, was done. And the truth was... This gentleman, on New Year's Eve, was on his way home, drunk as a skunk, fell into some trash barrels where a family of raccoons were dining and didn't appreciate it. And so they tore him up, but the media never came back. So you are left with an image, a pack of dirty, stinky coyotes attacked me. So one thing about coyotes in the media is don't ever believe 100% what they're saying and wait and see if there's any change later on, which there usually isn't. But then call me, I'll give you the truth. <laughs> yeah, I think so. Right, right. Because they're just moving into the, into the state. Um, so their activity just surrounds their family and food, and that's it. They, you know, they just want to feed their family and, and stay intact. If you see a, co a, a coyote, Scaring it away is so unbelievably easy, it's incredible. But I'm going to teach you how to do it. <laughs> thing about hazing is for years we've been told, you wave your arms, bang pots and pans, and yell at it, right? How many times have you heard that? A lot, right? Well, what's happening is animal control officers all around the state are getting calls saying, Lady calls up, she goes out in the back deck, she waves arms, bangs pots and pans, and the guy looks at her like, what else you got? <laughs> and the reason is, is because she didn't haze it properly. So I'm going to teach you how to haze coyotes properly, because it works. But first, let's ask a few questions. Why haze them? Why don't we just get rid of them? A, state law, you cannot trap and relocate wildlife in Massachusetts. It ain't happening. And as I talked about earlier, about transient coyotes, you know, if, if you have a, an alpha pair, you, with a little bit of time and effort, you could figure out what their territory is. But transient coyotes don't have one. Their territory is wherever their nose takes them. And so trying to get rid of the transient coyotes is nearly impossible. And so what happens is when we try to get rid of coyotes, we don't get them all. 
and they end up breeding very young and immature and inexperienced. So we end up compounding the problem. I think I just said that. <laughs> I, I, I think I also talked about this, you know, mama being the enforcer, but, you know, sh she's also preventing them from breeding with other um, coyotes. And right now, we're killing about 400,000 coyotes every year, about one a minute. And the way we've been doing it, and I say we, I'm talking about federal and state local governments, is horrendous. If you would know what your taxes are paying for, you would just, you, you wouldn't believe it. They use a compound called Compound 1080. When I was stationed in Korea, I witnessed the effects of 1080 on animals. It is unbelievable. It is unbelievable. And yet our government uses that stuff all over the place to kill coyotes and other predators, wolves too. Um, and I might talk more about that. And you can read that, but uh, like I said, wildlife services have been, um, I mean, they shoot, they, they do with wolves what's called a gut shot. They shoot them from a helicopter, and instead of shooting them and killing them, you know, in the head, they shoot them in the gut. So they'll suffer in anguish for days and days and days on end. And these are people that your tax dollars and my tax dollars are paying him to do. So please do a little research in this stuff. And then stand up to your congressmen and your politicians and tell them you don't want this stuff. Okay, one last thing about that. I just lost a really good friend of mine, Virginia Fuller. She's about 82 years old. This woman has been a wildlife champion her whole life. And she was one of the key people that got the law changed back in 1996, outlawing the use of leg hole traps. And ever since then, the authorities, almost every single year, hold these public meetings because they want to get them back. So please, pay attention. Find out when those meetings are at and go and voice your opinion. Okay, hazing. We already know, banging pots and pans just doesn't work anymore, right? <clears throat> In order to properly haze a coyote, you have to completely scare him away from the area. And that's the key, okay? Be dominant, show you, you, you know, be brave, be tough, puff out, look big. Um, be brave. And we can do hazing, hazing groups, but um, first let's talk, I, I, I kind of mixed some slides up, I guess, but when not to haze is really important, okay? Because sometimes you don't need to haze coyotes. <clears throat> If you go out, you know, if you see a coyote, before you do anything, just stop and, and, and observe it for a minute. Check him out. See what he's doing. If it's your backyard and he's just out there sleeping and you don't want him there, then we're going we're gonna to teach you how to, how to um, haze it. But first, observe it. If you see a lot of flies around it, could mean he has an injury somewhere. Um, if he gets up and he's limping, it's obvious. Anything like that, you call Diane. Okay? Diane will do her best to get that animal to Tufts and get him fixed or to put him out of his misery if need be. <clears throat> okay, so if you, you go out in your backyard and you see a coyote and he looks at you, jumps up and runs away, does he need to be hazed? Nah, he already is totally terrified of people. That's their natural behavior, totally terrified of people. Okay, nervous posturing. Um, I'm gonna show you some pictures about uh, what, what nervous posturing is. Coyotes will sometimes posture show you that he doesn't like your presence rather than attacking. <clears throat> okay, so it could be a den nearby. If it's April, May, and you come across a coyote in the woods, and he stops and he's kind of watching you, and he's not moving, probably means that he's got a den nearby. So give him a little respect and pick up your dog and just go the other way. With pups, obviously. That's, you don't want to touch him. And sick and injured again, call Diane. Okay, so posturing. This is what a coyote does when he's trying to let somebody or another animal know that he's not happy. You see, um, very arched back, 
tail is tucked, and they snarl and open their mouths. Um, they'll do this with dogs. Now, he could attack this dog, right? They're comparable in size. I'd put my money on the coyote. But he's choosing not to because that's risky. And if he could posture and show that dog he doesn't want him around, the dog leaves, mission accomplished. Okay, so, where's Lily? <clears throat> this is Lily. She's been with me for seven, 18 years now. Long, long time. So microphones to Kyle. Uh, let's see, who's he gonna stare at? Oh, he's gonna stare right at you. Yeah, rehabber. Okay, so this is what you have to do to, to properly haze a coyote. I want everyone to take note of this. I want to see handwriting, okay? Everyone, make sure you know how to do this, okay? And it's fun. If you got kids, oh, it's awesome. Okay. You go out in your backyard, there's a coyote. 50 feet away, 20 feet away, whatever. And he's just laying down, curled up in a ball. And you say, hey, get out of here. And he just kind of lifts his head and looks at you. Okay. Well, this one obviously has seen all that stuff before and there's nothing bad happened, so he's not afraid. So now what you have to do is haze him. You could do it any way you want. All I've ever done is I just look at him and I walk right toward him. It's very aggressive. That's an aggressive posture. When somebody's just coming at you like this. So that's all I've ever done. You can throw things. I don't recommend you throw anything at them because if you hit them and injure them, you can't ever predict what an injured animal is going to do. But you can throw stuff near them. But the key thing is you want to get them up running. Okay? Once you get him up, get his attention, he's going. Typical coyote behavior is he's going to run 40, 50 yards, and he's going to stop and re turn around and reevaluate. If he sees you marching in the house going to drink a Sam Adams to celebrate, then you just taught him that all that stuff meant nothing. So when he turns around, it is key that he sees you still coming at him. And that second time really gets their attention. They really perk up, and then they take off. And at that point, he's going to be gone you're not going to see him. So just go another 100 feet or so and stop and puff out and look like a predator and look around because he's watching you. But see, now you just, you just put it in his head to stay away from humans. And it works. It's simple modifica behavior modification. We do it with dogs all day long, and they are a dog. They're in the dog family. So that's the big secret to hazing is you just got to do it right. If he gets up and runs away, you're not done, okay? Um, there's a lot of communities that are now joined by email. They have these community, whatever they're called. Yeah, and I actually did a presentation in Winchester in somebody's house. It was the best one. I got to drink wine and everything. It was cool. <laughs> but there was like 30 people there. It was a great thing to do where the whole community gets together as a whole, and they said, okay, we've got coyotes. Let's listen to this guy and see what we're going to do. And so they elected to get together, learn how to do the hazing, and they did it. And they've had no problems with coyotes. It works. Okay? Coyote issues isn't a coyote issue. It's people issue. Okay, it's a community-based program. Um, remember, your ACO can't be everywhere. So in regards to coyotes, we've got to help out a little bit because she's got her hands full with all kinds of stuff. So get your little communities together, your little neighborhood things. Get together and say, hey, you know, I saw this, this banana head talking about coyotes, and I think I know how to haze them. i got a nice hazing guide up here, too, you can grab. And, and practice and do it. And call me. I'll come and, do, and, and show you how to do it again. It's easy. And it is very, very, very effective. And you see, it's a win-win because by doing this, we have coyotes in our communities that are eating the rats, the woodchucks, the rabbits, all those little animals that we complain about all the time, rats. So they're in there doing a free service for us, and we just haze them occasionally, and they leave us alone. And all we really, other than that, have to do 
Let's protect our own private animals a little bit better. The day you're letting your dog out in the backyard at 2 o'clock in the morning and your dog weighs 6 pounds are over. Okay? Coyotes are opportunistic. They just go where their nose takes them, but they make notes. If they come by your house at 2 o'clock in the afternoon and your little 3-pound Yorkie is sitting on the back step and he kind of takes note of that, and then two weeks later it comes by and it's 2.15 and dog's out in the backyard, he'll, he'll take note of that. And then one of the days he's going to come over the fence and they could jump a six-foot fence, okay? And I, I could show you how to make a coyote roller on your fences so they can't, but anyway. Um, <clears throat> forgot what I was saying. What was I talking about? I'm getting old. <laughs> All right, so get involved. The hazing groups are great. Um, activate those um, uh, uh, neighborhood associations. They really work. It's great. And it's a lot of fun. And Project Kaya would love to see you keep records and share them and all that. I don't really care. I just think it's great that you get out there and haze coyotes. Um, so you just got to get out there and do it. All right, so your plan of action. Appreciate what coyotes do for us. Appreciate the fact that they're here because of our intolerances. And so we've got, to, we've got to learn a little bit. We've got to learn to be a little bit more compassionate. We've got to learn to live with other things because other things are getting extinct. We all, I hope you all know that right now we're under the sixth mass extinction, right? We're, we're, we're all dying. I mean, the world is not in good shape. But anyway, appreciate what coyotes do for you. If they're not running around biting your kids and eating your dogs and cats, then they're just eating rabbits and rats and mice. That's a good thing. You can establish hazing programs, or I kind of talked on that. Um, keep your pets fascinated at least and, and, and protected. It's your duty. If you have animals, it's your duty to care and provide for that animal. You, in, in regards to dogs, dogs will, will, will die to help to do anything for you. They live to serve. They just, that's how they are. So we need to repay them. <clears throat> Don't feed coyotes or any wildlife. Number one cause of coyote conflicts is food, whether it's intentional or unintentional. You can coyote proof, kind of a stretch there, but you know, clean up if you have compost, clean it up a little bit. Um, if you've got bushes that are growing from the ground straight up, you know, cut about two feet of branches on the bottom so it takes away their ambush. And all you people can participate and get in there. Got to remember the police department, the animal control department, they're busy. You call up the police and say, oh, there's a coyote in my backyard. They're going to be like, okay, ma'am, we'll help you. <laughs> but really, I mean, there's people, you know, stabbing people. I mean, they, they, they have important things to do. They don't want to be running around, and they don't need to. That's why we're all here tonight. And coyote management is definitely people management, without question. Okay, so conclusion they are here to stay. Like I said, when the world ends, we'll have cockroaches and coyotes. Use common sense. Keep things in perspective. Don't always trust what the news is telling you. Um, I've always relied on my wildlife common sense. And, you know, when something doesn't add up, I question it. Removing or exterminating coyotes is not going to happen. And, and people have tried. Our government has tried. I think it was uh, Tennessee. They spent... This is like, you know, in the 40s, 50s. They spent $80,000 to recoup $60,000 worth of damages to a livestock. So they spent $80,000 trying to kill coyotes, and they just came back. And simple precautions. That's all we got to do. It's very simple. People, we're not talking about grizzly bears. We're not talking about cougars, killer whales. This animal, when it sees you, it just wants to get away. Dr. Way, my buddy, who used to trap coyotes and put collars on them and stuff, when he got them in a big box trap, you know what he, how, he, how he got the blood and all that? He opened the trap and he crawled right in. And the coyotes had just went to the very back and just trembled. And he was able to take blood, get, you know, put collars on and everything. They're big chickens. They don't want anything to do with people. But yet if we get involved and we start feeding them, then it's a whole different ball game. But coyotes who act naturally are no problem uh, with people at all. Get the facts. I love coyotes. I'm not here trying to change your mind. I'm just trying to give you the facts about coyotes. <clears throat> and take a stand. Be proactive. Uh, the environment needs us big time, really big. 
Okay, now it is 8.010, eight, oh, ten, eight, nine, uh, 10 after 8. I could do a quick five minute tracking class if anybody's interested. If not, I can do questions and answers. You guys want to learn how to track a coyote? All right, yeah, of course you do, it's fun. <laughs> all right, we're going to skip that. I'm going to skip that. All right, these are just pictures of coyotes. I have to go all the way to the end. I'll go back. <laughs> See that one with the, just the head? Next tattoo. These are all these pictures I took in Belmont. Come on. I didn't think I had that many. The river otter, Belmont. Isn't that cool? You gotta be kidding me. Is it not in here or what? All right, bear with me. There we go. What John was just saying about coyotes um, not biting and the gentleman that was collaring them not getting bit. I was like three weeks on the job and I got a call, no idea what I'm doing. Um, and I got a call, truly, and I got a call that there was an injured coyote. It was up near Jason Street, right on the side of the street. So I went over and I thought, there it was on the street. Now its upper body was up, like okay, but there was something wrong with the back legs. And I thought, I've never touched a coyote in my life. I'm not even sure how to do this. So I just went in low and slow. I put my gloves on that come to like here. And low, I never saw an animal look so defeated in my entire life. I still have a picture of it. And it's one of my most memorable rescues because it was defeated, terrified, hungry, all of those things that had just given up. And she let me pick her up, put her in a dog crate. I drove her to Tufts and they did surgery on her. It was an old injury. She had been hit by a car and it healed incorrectly. So she was just unable to sustain herself and like literally collapsed in the street. So they were able to help her. And there was just another incident in Winchester um, where a village of us, <clears throat> a young pup was hit by a car and it was gonna be euthanized. And phone calls were made and we asked the officers not to euthanize after finding out how badly it was hurt or not, it wasn't hurt that badly. Um, we got a driver, her and her husband brought it to Tufts and they were able to pick the pup right up. No bites, no aggression. And I was just shocked by that, you know? So you're so right, John, you really do know what you're talking about. <laughs> it's, all bull. it's all bull. All right, tracking 101. First of all, if you haven't seen a coyote, um, kind of have to know what they look like, right? So where's Lily? Come here, Lily. Now, Lily was estimated to be about a two-year-old female. And the reason why we know that is that her ears are all boogered up, mostly from my Ford. But she had boogered up ears when I got her, which means that she was probably just getting, you know, in that breeding um, time in her life. And um, so she's, she's like a small, average-sized female coyote. She was hit by a car down the Cape. So, First of all, coyotes can be black, white, red, um, brown, brindle, any kind of color. Um, they usually have this woodland, I call it the woodland camo, right? But they all seem to have this creamy white patch underneath their chin right here. They all have yellow eyes, although there was one in California about two months ago that had blue eyes. Really cool. Um, tail. It's heavy, it's long, and it always hangs. It doesn't come up. It's just, it even wags like this. So if you could, if you train one of these, they might be able to, you know, sweep your floor. Okay, so those are the general things about coyotes. Um, also, coyote scat tells us a lot. You may not see coyotes, but you may go out in your backyard and see this poop and say, hey, what's that? Well, this is a typical coyote scat. Um, 
probably too much light, but this is really light brown and this is really dark. When animals or anybody digests meat and blood, it comes out black. So it's, this is all black, but this was nuts, uh, a lot of like, I don't know what kind of nuts they were, but oak nuts or something. But there was a bunch of nuts in here. Bunch of nuts in here, right? <laughs> and this, this scat um, is actually, I hate to admit it, but that's a youth soccer jersey. <laughs> uh, I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. Um, I will tell you that you, you get a lot of information when you poke through scat. And so I do it a lot. And there's, in 17, 18 years of doing this, I've only found a couple that had unnatural stuff in it. And this was one of them. And no, there was no children. So looking up close, well, the lights are awful here. Um, you can't see it, but this little um, teeth right here, there's a little shell right here. You can see all the little hairs. So this animal's been eating rodents, basically. Up close, this, you know, hip bones. That's not a grandmother, it's not a kid, okay? They're not running around dragging people in the woods and eating them. Okay, so tracking. Well, they're a canine, right? So we gotta know the difference between dog and coyote. Very simply, dogs have a nice round track with four prominent toenail imprints, okay? Nice and round. And remember, we have all kinds of different sized dogs, so those tracks can be, you know, big and small. Coyote track, it's oval. And you'll only see two toenails imprints right up front. They're also what's called the direct registering animal, which means that back foot always falls in that front foot track. So when you're looking at tracks, you're looking at the back leg, because the front feet are smaller. I'll tell you a quick funny story. Um, when I was at ACO, I, I frequently did six to two shifts. And I love six to two because it was two hours before my boss got to work and, and you know, people waking up, so I got no calls. So I dedicated that time to go you know, look for coyotes and stuff. And uh, we had fresh snow, about a half inch of snow. It was still just you know, flake here and there coming down. I pull into Rock Meadow parking lot and there's a fresh set of tracks going out in the meadow. And I thought, yeah. So I grab my camera and I go. And I'm going, I'm going, I'm going. And I'm a pretty good tracker, I'm no expert, but I'm tracking this guy, I'm tracking him. I'm thinking, oh, any minute I'm gonna see it. And all of a sudden, after about a half mile, the track split. So the whole time, I was tracking two coyotes and didn't even know it, because the one on the back was stepping exactly where the other one went. It was really cool, really cool. All right, so again, coyote track is oval. You'll see the two toenail imprints up front. You know, like you can see a little, a slightly one here, but you know, you get into mud and they can really see the, the whole pattern of the foot. Dog track, this guy is a couch potato, he's overweight. <laughs> Look at the nails. The owner hasn't cut the nails in months, right? So Ophido is Mr. Couch Potato. He's gonna run out there and just have a grand old time. But again, his track is nice and old, uh, round and you usually see four prominent um, toenail in. Um, tracks. Again, coyote, oval. Comparison, this isn't a size thing, okay, but again, oh, uh, we're nice and round, and this is oval. This is a coyote print up close. And this picture, <laughs> it always gets me. I don't know why I didn't take this squid-looking thing out of there before I snapped the picture, but I didn't. But you can see four toenail imprints. See them? Usually don't see that one and that one, but because it's you know really soft substrate mud type stuff, you got a really good view of the of the foot, and you don't normally see this pad or that pad. So usually you see this part right here. Okay, so now I'm done, and I'll entertain any questions. Uh, one thing I want to uh, one thing I want to clear up. Somebody asked me about this yesterday. So a lot of people think that coyotes will lure your dog by playing with it and then lure it into the woods and eat it. You guys hear that? Anybody believe that? It's not true. What usually happens is the dog is unleashed, he sees a coyote, 
He doesn't know if he wants to play or kill it, but he's off to, he takes off after it. And that coyote's going to bolt, and he's going to bolt right to his rendezvous spot. And on his way, he's going to let out a couple of barks, yip, yip, and family's going to be there waiting. And it's not usually going to end good for your dog. But again, that's something that's under your control. Okay, so I'll entertain any questions. Yes, sir. Um, sir, is there a good time of day to let cats out? Cats? Is there a good time of day to let cats out? Um, I'll say it's, it's probably better during the day. Low light hours is when they become active. But again, if you see all my pictures, they're all taken during the day. So you can see coyotes at any time. Um, I get the thing about cats. So I have a cat. I've had many cats in my life. And if they've been an outdoor cat and you want to train them to be an indoor cat, you've got to put up with about three weeks of howling and screaming. But if you can endure it, after about three weeks, they kind of give up. And I was a vet tech in the Army for 20 years. I've worked for hundreds of veterinarians. And I can bet you my Harley, there's not a veterinarian alive that's going to tell you your cat is much more healthy outside. Ain't going to happen. And a lot of people think that cats have to nurture their wild instinct in order to be healthy. Not true. And if it was, get your little laser pen and do that all day. Your cat will have a blast. <laughs> Questions? Yes. Great question. If you're out walking your dog, and you've got your dog on leash, and you come across coyotes. Okay, a couple different variations. If it was me, and I had, say, a 30-pound or more dog, then I would just stop, keep my dog on leash, and observe. And if they were just standing their ground, I might test them a little bit, because I'm that way. I'm not afraid of them. So I might go a little bit up. But if they're really set on posturing, then I'll respect that and I'll go the other way. If you have a little dog, pick him up and put him in your shirt or jacket. Because we all know that little dogs are the biggest, baddest animals on the planet. <laughs> and they will take on any coyote, right? So you put him in your jacket because he's going to be squirming around and you don't want him to get out. Okay? So little dogs, that's what you want to do. What kind of dogs? Dachshunds? I don't think a coyote would eat a dachshund. It's a hot dog. You'd be all over it. Um, you know, that's a good question because dachshunds, you can't just scoop up because of their back. So what you really need to do is just leave. Um, never turn your back on them. And I don't say that because there's a risk of them getting attacked. But you want to know where they're at because you want to feel safe and comfortable too. And I usually tell people, look, grab a stick, because a stick will make you feel a little bit empowered. So if you've got two little dogs like in that situation, you, you can't pick up dachshunds, it's not good. You just start going out. And if a coyote comes in, just try to get your dogs behind you and get between them. And you know. I agree with that. I also want to ask, what do you think about the fact of the leashes for small dogs? No, I know a few ACOs have lost fingers because of those things. They're no good. Throw them out. Get rid of them. And the fact that, let's say you do have a retractable leash for your little dog, so that it can wander off 10 feet, 15 feet, and it keeps, you know, keeps, you know, do all the things it wants to do. It can't go off leash, so this is kind of a compromise. Coyotes love retractable leashes. By the time that coyote hits that little dog that seems to be off on its own over there, it's gone and it's right out of your hand. I don't like them. I don't suggest them. I would like them to be just never used. Yes. Did you all hear that? That if you drop it, it and the dog runs even more. Um, 
I don't like them. But I, again, I want to emphasize what John said because it does work. Eye contact, right to that coyote, right? So I think one of the biggest predators on Earth, John, is it not humans? And there's a saying, eyes in front likes to hunt. Eyes on the side likes to hide. So let's think about rabbits or lambs or gazelles. Eyes on the side. That's so they're watching all around because they are a prey animal. They want to be seen. Eyes in front likes to hunt. So when you approach that coyote, do you say coyote or coyote? Either way. Okay. Sometimes I use both. Um, when, you are, when you see that coyote, because I had to call John at one time for a situation with my dog who um, fought a coyote in my yard, and it was strictly my dog's fault. The coyote was just strutting by a neighbor's yard, looked over at us, and Smitty, who's off leash at my house and under a voice command, so I thought, um, <laughs> bolted and took on, and it was, I don't want to call it a fight, but it was a, and it was over. Um, but he kind of thinks he's Tom Brady. So now he stands outside in the woods, like uh, looking at the woods like this at night, like, bring it on. <laughs> bring it on. And I'm like, take it down a notch there, Hercules. But it's true for when you see a coyote, what John says is exactly right. It's eye contact. I'm the predator, right? So if I saw, and I saw a film of Deanna, the ACO in, in Waltham, and there was a coyote laying in someone's yard. They wanted it out. They had kids that were going out to play. They wanted that coyote. And she just walked, looking right at it like this. Eye contact. Like, I am the predator. <clears throat> Not you. Me. So um, it's very effective. I don't want people to be afraid. I've had, um, what's really strange is I was getting like 10 or 15 calls a day. And I decided to have this meeting, asked John to come and share his knowledge. And since we decided to have the meeting, not one phone call. <laughs> not one. So I'm going to do this for every situation. We're going to have a meeting. <laughs> Just saying. Yes, in the back. Zero, we don't know. We and neither does Mass Fish and Wildlife. Because Mass Fish and Wildlife keeps coming out with numbers. Oh, sorry. Um, Mass Fish and Wildlife keeps coming out with numbers, and uh, you know I've talked to Dr. Way about it many times. And unless you're you're actively collaring and, and researching coyotes, there's just no way to tell what the population is. Now Diane, she has a really good grip on wildlife and how how stuff works. So give her a little time, and I'm I'm willing to bet that over a period of time she'll figure out where the families are, where the territories are. But that side of town, the think of the golf course is a nice big open area, right? So there's a couple of families over there that I have been getting beautiful photographs. Did you all see my poster um, with that coyote family? That's a family from Arlington. A beautiful, I love that photo. A beautiful family. Is the woman here that took that picture? Pam or Colleen? No, they didn't make it. It happens to be a neighborhood that loves this coyote family. And I love that this neighborhood loves these coyotes. They know that they're eating the rats, getting rid of some of the rabbits that so many people are complaining about, eating their plants in their gardens and you know, wanting that population to be taken down. But um, it's, we have so many beautiful green spaces in Arlington. We really do. And we have waterways. And that's perfect, a perfect combination for coyote habitat. So I don't think that we're overpopulated, but we've got them on that side of the town. I know we've got them over near Monotomy. Um, we've got them in the east. We've got them everywhere. I mean, they're even in downtown Crossing, if you can believe that. They have adapted. It's amazing, but they've adapted to everywhere. Let me add real quick that, um, <laughs> I forgot what I was gonna add. I thought of something else. But they've actually been um, radio calling in downtown Boston living in you know, one or two city blocks, finding enough food, 
rats, cats, nice. whatever, to survive just fine. So they could they could be anywhere. Um, I can't remember what I want. Yes, ma'am. Um, are you asking about the, <clears throat> excuse me, the two coyote pups that were found dead? Mm, this is such a sad story to me. Um, I know that the advocate did a story in the paper about it. Um, I didn't post anything on my Animal Control Facebook site about it, but it was two of the pups from the family in that picture on my poster. I know, and I feel like, aren't you all wonderful? Because I have people that have called me who are demanding that I trap and relocate them. Demanding, and they're angry. I have other people that are frightened. They're worried about their children and the young children, the toddlers in the neighborhood. And you know, to try to let them know that there's no reason to be afraid. But to get back to the two coyote pups, the woman that took the photo of that family had shared it with me, and I loved it. Because the dad looks so strong, doesn't he, right? He's looking right at the camera protectively. And then to his right is the mom, who's kind of elegant. And she's looking down so lovingly at her four pups. I think it's such a beautiful photo. And I loved that there was a successful pack family unit in Arlington. And, you know, I'm getting, I don't know how many calls a day on rabbits and rats. So many. The coyote calls have stopped since we had this meeting. I'm expecting them <laughs> to start up again tomorrow. But um, we need the coyotes. We need them. I'm the one who finds the dead cats that have been eaten by coyotes. How do you or, know? I'll question that. How do you know? Well, um, I mean, do you want me to get really graphic or? It could have been a, what are you going to say? It could have been a fisher cat? No, what I'm saying is, if you didn't see it happen. I didn't. Then you don't know if that cat was hit by a car and then. Oh, no. Pray, uh, you know, then eaten. Oh, maybe. You okay, I see what you're saying. You don't know all the, the things. And it always bothers me when someone sees a cat, missing cat poster on a, on a telephone pole. The first thing they say is, oh, a coyote got it. I'm like, well, you know what? You like a cat out. How do you know? Well, what I was going to, and that's a really good point. I'll, I'll come back to your question. But that's a really good point because I don't know. Maybe it did get hit by a car and then someone feasted on it. My point in bringing that up was there's one family that saw a coyote take their cat. They chased it and it dropped it and the cat was dead. There were two cats that I found that were half eaten. I can't tell you how many I found hit by cars. Maybe 10 or 12, 13, 14. So that's the bigger danger. One that I thought was poisoned by rat poison. Um, it was pretty good signs that it was. But in terms of those two coyote pups, I was heartbroken. And the woman that had taken those pictures, um, she came home to find one of the pups dead in her yard. And she sent me the photo. It was bleeding from the ears. And I was heartbroken because I thought, who predates on coyote pups but humans, right? With the parents there. I mean, who's going to predate on them? Um, and some people had said, oh, it could be a hawk. It could be. It's not a hawk. It's not an owl. It's absolutely illegal. Right. So, and I agree with you, and you can't take, what's that? So she was just saying that a uh, family of coyotes had um, been poisoned in Winchester. Was it proven that they were poisoned? Or suspected. Okay. And that's, you know, I'm a big proponent. If you know me, I hate rat poison. I've never been a fan um, for a long, long time. However, by not being able to look at these coyote pups, so the one pup was dead. She got a picture. 
the body disappeared. Another pup showed up the same day dead on her lawn, and that body disappeared. She sent me the two pictures. They're two different pups. So I called John to say, <clears throat> first of all, would the parents take their bodies? And he said, well, I've never heard of it, but I mean, just what was going on here? I couldn't tell. It happened on a Sunday when they called me, and there was no way for me to get, I was unable to get there to take the bodies, to look at them myself, to see had they been shot, had they been poisoned, had that, what happened to them? I couldn't tell, and I couldn't make a guess without having seen the bodies, but I was heartbroken over it. I was heartbroken over it. And, um, you know, I, I've had people call me demanding that I trap and relocate them. I'm not sure where. My husband said, like, where, Lowell? Where are you gonna bring them? <laughs> um, but saying that, you know, there are people saying, well then, you know what, I'll kill them myself. And, you know, so explaining to them that, you know what, that's against the law, and you can't even really threaten to do that, so they were reported. Um, so, I forget where I was going with that, but with the poisoning and the, and the killing them themselves, what John said is, now it opens that territory up, and you have no idea, but you've just created a bigger problem. There are gonna be more coyotes now moving into that territory than what you thought you had a problem with. There's a lot of fear, and I agree with John 100% when he says the news. We don't hear anything great on the news about coyotes. We hear about, you know, um, ate a dog from Woburn. Oh my gosh, it made the news. How heartbreaking for that family. Um, but it's front and center on the news, and people are terrified. If you have small dogs, what John said, there is no such thing as letting your dog out in even your fenced-in yard to potty by itself anymore. There isn't. You go outside with it. When I used to have my own dog walking business and I walked with my pack off leash in Burlington, you could if they were under voice command, I always carried mace with me and I carried a stick. Not that anybody's gonna bother six, of, six dogs and me. I felt quite safe. But I expected coyotes to be within 100 yards of me at all times. I just expected it. They're everywhere. Um, I really didn't take small dogs into my pack when I was out hiking unless they were on leash and right next to me, although the pack would protect them as well. But I don't want them running ahead of me in the woods. It, it's just coyotes are everywhere. I want your small dogs. As he said, letting cat, cats outside, you're putting your cats into the food chain by letting your cats go outside. However, I will say this too. I thought a lot about this because I have a lot of calls on cats. Cats, outdoor cats can be pretty street smart, right? They know where to hide. They know what porches to go on, how to get on roofs, trees. They're pretty street smart. But I can tell you that something as simple as a windy night or maybe a little bit of rain, and it distorts sound. Nature is sounds very different when there's snow, when there's wind, when there's rain. And that savvy street smart cat may not hear something sneaking up on it. It's something as simple as that. Um, so, you know, I want your cat safe. I want your pet safe. I know that you and your children are safe. I don't need to worry about that. You know, we have very strict protocol for rabies in Massachusetts. That's why we don't have many cases of rabies. It's a very strict protocol, very black and white. There's no gray area. And that's why we have um, really no rabies cases. I have something else that I need to show you. It's a bit of a fashion show. Um, did you ever hear of a coyote, coyote vest? All right, Lainey, can you take, this is Doug, and Lainey's gonna take him up on stage so that you can see. I want John to comment on what he thinks about this. Um, if you can see it from a distance. We need a runway. We might have you walk the runway too. Look at Doug and Lainey. Hi, Doug. Can you see the spikes on his vest? So his owner lives in a pretty rural area, um, North Shore, but near power lines, which I believe are like highways for wildlife. So it's kind of considered a high coyote area. And I asked her, she told me about this vest and told me I could borrow him to show you. And I said, you know, what are your thoughts on the vest? What do you think about it? And she said, well, Sometimes it gives me a little bit of security. 
meaning that if something ran into her yard, she's out there watching him, he's small and she has an even smaller dog, um, that she keeps her eyes on him. She's proactive with trying to keep him safe. But this was a little bit of additional security that she felt she had should a coyote come running into the yard. But John had other opinions about it, and we want to hear both sides. You know it's up to you what you want to use for your pets. But John, you had some opinions on that? Yeah, I think, I think it'll work once. I think once a coyote grabs it and, and feels the pain of those spikes, um, He's got two choices. One, he'll never try it again. Or the next time, he'll come up and grab the dog by the leg and shake it and kill it and eat around it. I don't like him. I, I, I don't like him. I think it gives you a false sense of security. And, you know, if a coyote does come and try to grab it and you get punctures in his mouth, are you going to take him to a vet? No. So, you know, you, you're going to cause undue undo suffering to another animal. So I'm not a favor of it. I, don't, I just don't think it would work. I, I think a coyote might, you know, they certainly like to go after the neck. You know, they, they shake. That's how they kill them. I've seen, I've seen coyotes kill animals. They grab, oh, he, but he looks, looks cool. like a little tough guy. I was going to use cool. another word, but. You know, I had a little, with the last pack, the last per person I was with, we had seven dogs. They are all big except one. It was a min pin. And we had a few of our Standard poodles would pin them in the corner all the time. So we bought a spike collar. We named them Spike, and that was it. <laughs> they never messed with them again. But my opinion is, is I, I think it gives the owner false sense of security. Um, I do think it would work at least once, but I think if a coyote was hungry enough and, and came back to the area and that dog was wearing that, he may just go for it and know where not to bite. Anybody have any questions? Because people are starting to leave. I want to make sure you get any questions. Yes, sir. I'll just say this. I know in Arlington, the town of Belmont, same. You cannot discharge a firearm within 500 feet of a, a dwelling. There is no hunting areas in Arlington or Belmont. So you cannot shoot a coyote. You can call a problem animal control officer, which I hate that whole term, but they're just, they're just guys that go to Mass Fish and Wildlife, spend 200 bucks, and they get this permit to kill anything they want based on your complaint. But the law is pretty clear. Coyotes have to be causing damage or threatening to the residents. And we just uh, never see that. I never see, rarely do I ever see a good reason to, to remove a coyote. It's not absolute. No. Danger to what? Um, I think any time a coyote is active. The question was saying that they're corpuscular, more active at dawn and dusk or in the evening at times when humans are not around. Hearing about them being seen in the daytime, when does John feel can, uh, could be the most dangerous time? Did I say there's, that there's right? There's just a lot of factors go into what's happening during the day. If a coyote goes in your backyard and it's quiet, he's like napping behind your garage, and you decide to cut your lawn, well, he's going to get up and move. So they frequently get, get bothered by people and you know, cars and um, lawn cutting machines or whatever. So they may find a spot where they're, they're very comfortable and calm and then that could change. So then they're on the move and then you see them during the day. 
They could be hungry. The night before could be uh, unsuccessful hunting. So that means they're hungry, they're going to hunt during the day. Yes, sir. I think if it's, if it's other than January and February, you have little to worry about. Little to worry about. Yes. Uh, sorry, we should have handed over the mic. We're tired and hot. Yeah. Sorry. I, I just said that we have two large dogs that we walk the golf course pretty much every night at dusk when everybody else is gone. It's beautiful. I see the coyotes often. I don't see them as often as I used to. I don't know. I think closer. the path has changed. Closer. Oh, sorry. I'm not used to this. I'm, I can usually you, get in front of the classroom now? and yell. Um, but anyway, the point being that we have never had a problem with the coyotes on lead with my dogs. Never. And they've come as close as from here to that wall. And I've seen them. They've seen us. They just move along. I mean, I watch them. I make sure that I'm not walking toward where I think they need to be and we don't need to be. But I know where the den sites are. I know where they hang out. So I don't go to that part of the golf course. But they're out there. And they have never, ever. And this is, I mean, what would you say, 10 years? They've never come up to us with dogs on lead. Having said that, with dogs off lead, it's a whole different ball game. I've heard of dogs getting bit as they run into sites where the, the coyotes hang out. So it's just what John said. What the main th focus that coyote is going to have is you. So as long as you're close to your dog, it's all he's really going to be concerned about because he doesn't want to be near you. So if you have your dog on a four-foot leash, five-foot leash, or you're, you're carrying him, a coyote really is concerned about you, and he doesn't want to be with you at all. So I consider that very low threat. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. And I'll tell you something else. I, I've handled a lot of coyotes, and I've dealt with animals all my life, and I've always thought I was a good judgment of size and weight. And, and I was real good in the Army. I could judge a dog's weight within five pounds almost all the time. But coyotes, they just look so much bigger than they really are. I picked up a coyote here in Arlington a long time ago with the Arlington ACO. She got hit by a car, and we got her on the rabies pole, and we were going to put her in my work van. And the other guy had the head, and I said, okay, look, Tom, I'll grab the, le the back, and we'll, on, on three, we'll get her up in there. And I was thinking she was good 40 pounds, I and mean, she was healthy coyote. You ever reach in the refrigerator, grab a gallon of milk, and there's only this much in the gallon, but you can't see it? You go, right? I almost threw that coyote through the, through the van. She weighed in at Tufts at 22 pounds. Wow. And I've handled a bunch of them, and I can tell you, for whatever reason, I mean, I know that in the wintertime they have five inches of fur, so that's probably accounts of it. But for some reason, they just look a whole lot bigger than what they really are. You know, so I mean, if I was ever attacked by a coyote, I'm thinking 20, 25 pounds, pff, get out of here. No threat to me. Yes, sir. Yeah, fine. Now, coyote would have to be pretty desperate to jump a fence, although they could do it. Um, and they, I mean, they can clear a six-foot fence. 
But you can, most fences have, you know, posts with a section in the middle, and those posts are usually a little bit higher, right? If you could get a tight cable between each post and put one inch um, PVC pipe, which is cheap, through that, so what happens is he jumps up, tries to hook his paws on the top, and he just rolls right off. <laughs> it works. Yes, sir. Who's more scared of what? You know, turkeys can be dangerous. You know, they got that spur in the back. Um, I've never, I've never found any turkey feathers in any scat. Um, and and I've actually, I hate to say, I hate to admit this, but I got outrun by a one-legged turkey once. So, I mean, they could fly and all that. But I think generally they would much rather pounce on a little rabbit than try to tangle with a turkey. Yes, ma'am. They absolutely can. They used to, people used to think gray fox was the only canid that would climb trees. But now we have plenty of proof. Uh, I, you know, I saw a video in Boston right outside MIT. Coyote just got up at the... <laughs> up in the tree and was eating pears or something a couple of years ago. But yeah, they can climb. They'll just jump up and climb and eat, eat you know, I've eat well. I've pictures of them in apple trees, too, eating apples. I want to make sure everyone's questions are answered. Yes, ma'am. No, it's a good question. Okay, in relation to foxes, general rule is if you have foxes in the area, you probably don't have coyotes. If you have coyotes in the area, they've probably killed or ran off all the foxes. That's the general rule. However, from experience, I can tell you, remember about, it was probably eight years ago by now, when you couldn't go outside without stepping over chipmunks and squirrels. I mean, there were just rabbits, chipmunks everywhere. There was tons of food. And I remember there was a coyote den on this lady's property, and then about 100 And they were all active. And then another 100 feet this way, there was another fox den. And so we got two fox dens and a coyote den. How can that be? Well, what makes sense to me is if there's no food pressure, if there's plenty of food out there, no competition, be my guest, mi casa, you casa. That food gets low, I'm eating you. <laughs> so that's that. Any other questions? Yes, sir. Yeah. Because some nights you would sound like two or twenty, thirty, yeah. even more. But you said that it's. That's a. This is a really great thing. I, and I've I've had to edit my presentation because it gets it's. I I just want to put so much information in. I'd be here all night. So I trim a lot of stuff and I I trim that out. But what he's referring to is there was an actual study done, where coyotes can replicate their barks, yips, and howls. So each one can sound like three. So. If they kill a rabbit and there's only three of them, and this is the, the theory on why they do this. So if there's three coyotes and they kill a rabbit and they all start doing that and you're walking by, you're hearing nine coyotes. Are you going to go in there? Nah, you're going to leave, right? So that's the theory that when they start replicating and sounding like so many more, the reason is, is they want to make sure nothing's going to come in and get their food. But there's no solid research to to prove that, but that's what everyone um, um, believes. But the, 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 the point of them replicating is true. And it's really, if you ever listen to them, it's get on the internet and listen to some of the coyote sounds. It's crazy. Yes, ma'am. 1,800 rodents a year. Each coyote. One mouse or one rat through breeding in one year produces 16,000 young.
So she's asking about um, how many rats coyotes eat per day, and then to bring that a step further in um, a lot of companies, businesses, homeowners associations use rat poison in Arlington, and what does that do to poison the coyotes, the hawks, the fox, the owls, all of the animals that eat the rats. But I will give you some good news. You mentioned the Arlington Housing Corp, which they were talking about on Arlington List. Um, they called me yesterday. I didn't announce it um, on Facebook. I just, I can't announce everything. Some stuff I just, <coughs> excuse me. But they called to talk to me about what can we use for alternatives, and I almost drove off the road. Amazing. Absolutely, I, mean, I was blown away. So they're talking to a pest control company. I gave them questions to ask. Um, I love that they are looking at alternatives. And I am getting more and more phone calls every day on people saying, what can we use for alternatives? So the word is slowly getting out there. It really is. I'm amazed by it. I'm getting more phone calls from people saying, I'm not calling a pest control, I don't want poison, I have children, I have dogs, I don't want it in my yard, we're looking. So I think that it's going to be demand from the public that's going to drive the pest control companies to come up with some better alternatives that are cost effective and that work. And there are some options out there, and we can always talk about that another time, but um, I was thrilled, I was blown away, yes. So that was the suggestion that I gave them. In the boxes? They should go in the burrows, dry ice. No, dry ice goes in the burrows, but there are these new big bait boxes, and they have what's called T-Rex clamps. And T-Rex clamps are meant for rats, instead of the regular small mouse traps, which can kill very slowly. And even though they're rats, I don't, want, I don't like anything to suffer. T-Rex traps kill them instantly. So There's also the rat zapper. It's electronic. They yeah, go in, this, pff, dead. Pff like that. But it's expensive, so we want Yeah, but it's reusable. But it's reusable. Dump it, okay. reload it. All right, I got to wrap up. A um, couple of things. Um, I'm, I represent Project Coyote. I'm really proud of what Project Coyote has been doing over the last five years or so. Has made phenomenal progress in banning um, coyote killing contests or predator killing contests. And I want to tell you this because Massachusetts has them. They're goes on right here in this state, where you go with your kids and your wives and your friends and your whatever, you pay a fee and you get a prize for the biggest coyote or the most coyotes killed. And these guys go out there, they have these electronic devices that they put way out there. It's got a little thing that goes like this, gets their attention, it's got audio, it sounds like a, just a rabbit in distress, while they're sitting up a mile away drinking a beer, plugging them with high-powered rifles. And they call this hunting. It is disgusting. And I really, really want to impose on you to pick up the phone and call Mass Fish and Wildlife and tell them this is crap. I'm not anti-hunter, but this isn't hunting. This is wanton killing for no reason whatsoever. And this state supports it. Now, I will tell you this. Project Coyote got on the, the, this whole train, put a lot of pressure on Mass Fish and Wildlife, um, or, um, really urged a lot of people to call and write letters. And Mass Fish and Wildlife just came out with a statement, statement saying that they're, they don't, they're not going to support the coyote killing contest. So we may be changing that already. But like hazing, we have to keep the pressure on. So please, if you care about wildlife, if you care about the environment, pick up the phone tomorrow, call your representative, see where he stands on wildlife issues, and call Mass Fish and Wildlife and tell them this is disgusting that this state allows wanton killing of any kind of animal for no reason at all. When they're done with the contest, the carcasses just get dumped. It's disgusting. Disgusting. So please, get on the horn and do that. The last thing I want to tell you is um, Project Coyotes is a nonprofit organization. Um, we could use the money straight up. There are some envelopes up here that address to them. If you want to send them a check, great. You can go online, projectcoyote.org, and you can sign up for their quarterly newsletter. I unfortunately forgot the sign-up sheet because I usually have people sign up, 
and I send it in and they get you on the list. And you'll just get an email once a quarter of, of their, their, what they've been doing. But what they've been doing has been phenomenal. If you love wildlife and you love the earth, this place is awesome. So, um, so please go to, go to um, projectcoyote.org, sign up for their, their newsletter, and they may even ask you if you want to volunteer for something. So if you feel like you want to, say yes. Yes, ma'am. I'm sorry, I, I didn't hear. These are my cat people, John. I'm one of the administrators for the ACAT Facebook group, and um, I know that there are some of you here tonight, and thanks for being here. This was great to support Diane and the incredible work that she does. Um, do you know who was doing the filming tonight? Because I'd like to be able to direct people on ACAT to the video of this and encourage people on ACAT to go and make donations on your site. And I think being able to see the video would be huge. It's ACMI. Yeah, that, that woman right there. Also, there's, a, there's a, uh, a bunch of ladies here that are wildlife rehabbers. And I could tell you, as an ACO for 17 years, I couldn't have done it without them. So here, my wildlife rehabbers. Come on, come on, stand up. Come on. Stand up, Laurie. And these ladies could use your help too. It's mostly all out of pocket for them, and they, they do this with the with their compassion and, and huge heart. So please support them. New Ark. Thank you for coming.